Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship and the ministry of BBFOhio.com. That's BBFOhio.com. And the conclusion of our two-part study of Mark chapter 13, verses 24 through 26, titled, The Day of the Lord. We would like to thank those of you who are helping to support this ministry. Your prayers, letters of encouragement, and your financial contributions are a real blessing, and we don't want any of you to think that we take these things for granted. We work for the Lord with the conviction that Jesus may rapture us out of here at any moment, and we're thankful for all who work with us to preach the gospel and to teach the infallible King James Bible to those who desire to learn and grow in the Word of God. We will now pick up where we left off, getting ready to look at Joel chapter 2 as we join the conclusion of our study in progress, part 2 of our study of Mark chapter 13, verses 24 to 26, titled, The Day of the Lord. The Day of the Lord. Now Mark 13, 19, Jesus called the Great Tribulation, He used these words, this is a quote from Jesus, affliction, such as was not from the beginning of the creation, which God created unto this time, neither shall be. I was telling you before, they're coming out with a uh, movie about Noah's flood. And it's going to be goofy. It's Hollywood. I mean, they always mess it up. But I'm going to see it because I've seen some of the trailers and I want to see, and you're going to think I'm sick for saying this, I want to see the destruction. Why? Because they do get the destruction part right. And I want to tell you something. When I was unsaved, there were a couple of movies I saw, and the Holy Spirit got me. He stuck me. Because I had already heard it. I'd heard it preached. I'd heard people warning me. And then I went in and watched these movies. You know, they, I can't remember the names of all of them, but there was these apocalyptic movies, you know, but what was it, Mad Max, one of the goofiest movies ever made. And, um, you know, I'm watching this movie, and I just kept thinking, you know, it's weird that they made a movie that just seems so much like what's going to happen during tribulation period. And, these other, and I think, I really believe God will use Balaam's ass. And if there is a Balaam's ass in this world today, it's Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And it's, isn't it weird, isn't it strange how Hollywood just keeps wanting to go to the Bible to make money? Their motive's wrong. But Paul said there's even preachers whose motive is wrong. But he still praised God that they preached. Amen? Amen? And so Hollywood's making all this money. It's all going to burn. They got the wrong motive, but there are going to be people watch that flood who've been in Sunday school, who've been in church. I believe they're going to sit there and they're go their conscience is going to be pricked by the Holy Spirit. Amen? I, wanna, I want you to keep that in mind when this movie comes out that you pray for these people who go to that movie. I know people who went to see the Passion of the Christ. That thing has a bunch of garbage in it. It shouldn't be in there. But man, you saw like no other time did you see Jesus depicted in such a way that is so biblical with the beatings and the crucifixion scene. And there were people that I know who had not ever given Jesus a second thought that came out of that movie in tears. And some of them got saved. And Mel Gibson, man, he, I believe he still needs saved. I mean, that guy, but man, a lot. God, you talk about using a man that isn't called to preach, <laughs> but God used it. So here Jesus is talking about this day, and it's exactly how Joel described the day of the Lord in Joel 2, 1 and 2. Why don't you turn there? You've got your Bible open. Joel chapter 2. Now, one of the other groups that this kind of uh, corrects is the all-millennial crowd. The all-millennial crowd has this idea that we're just going to kind of go along and all of a sudden, boom, it's over. I call it the Big Bang Theory of End Time Prophecy. <laughs> they just think there's going to be one day and all of a sudden, boom, it's over and, and, and that's the day of the Lord. It's going to happen in, in one day. And Joel 2, verses 1 and 2 is where we're going. It was, when you read all these passages of the day of the Lord, you can see it's not just a single day. And so all millennialism is false, and there is going to be a thousand year kingdom. Jesus will rule and reign on this earth. Jesus said He was going to, and He's going to do it. And no matter what a theologian tells you, ignore them. Go with what the Bible plainly says. 
Joel 2 verse 1 says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Isn't it interesting how it's always about Israel? The day of the Lord comes down to Israel. I, you just never read, Blow ye the trumpet in New York. <laughs> but even those places that are named in the Bible, it doesn't say, Blow ye the trumpet in Spain, but Spain's in the Bible. It doesn't say, Blow ye the trumpet in Greece, but uh, Greece is in the Bible. It says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm in where? My holy mountain. Where's that at? Israel. What city? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Let all the inhabitants of the land. Now, when the Bible says the land, what is it talking about? Israel. I mean, it, there's, there's passages back there where God says it's, it's my land. My eyes are upon it. <laughs> uh, from day and night, you know, I'm watching that land. Uh, the United Nations and the uh, American uh, State, U.S. State Department need to get that through their heads. They keep trying to use that land for peace. It's not their land to use. For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Read verse 2. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. Now look, this is talking about the day of the Lord. If the day of the Lord is a single day, then it makes Jesus out to be a liar. Because Jesus already said the entire time of tribulation would be like a time that the world has never seen and never will ever again. Joel is talking about the day of the Lord and says the same thing. Now which one's right? Both. If the day of the Lord is the great tribulation period, they're both right. If the day of the Lord is just a single day at the end, one of them's wrong. Now listen, if your belief system makes a liar out of a prophet of God or God manifest in the flesh, change your theology. Change your opinions. There have been several times that I've believed things and then I come to the Bible and I say, wait a minute now. If what I believe is true... That is a problem because Jesus contradicts that. Or another prophet contradicts that. So who changes? You. Amen. Yeah. And right here, if you believe the day of the Lord is one day at the end of the tribulation period, you just saw where Joel describes the day of the Lord the same way Jesus describes the entire tribulation period. And they both can't be right unless... The Great Tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, the day of the Lord, Daniel's 70th week, all are together. Now, I won't say the same because of this one little addendum. The day of the Lord encompasses more than just the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation is seven years. The day of the Lord encompasses everything from the time of the uh, confirming of the covenant to the end of the millennium and that final uh, rebellion that's put down by the words of the mouth of the word. He will just speak and it'll be over. And that's the final day of the day of the Lord. And Mark 13 24 is obviously um, a reference to Joel 2. So th remember what we just read, Joel 2, and look again at Mark 13 24, and it says, but in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. Okay, remember that? Well, then you go back to Joel 2 and verse 28. It says, and it shall come to pass afterward. It's all still part of, but it's after all that you've read above. In verse 30 and 31, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. It's all intermixed every time you read about it. The day of the Lord, the great tribulation, the sun being darkened, the moon turning to blood, it's never separated out from the day of the Lord uh, being not part of the rest of the great tribulation period. It's all one huge event. And that's clear from the, again, Scripture with Scripture. The best commentary on the Bible is the? Bible. Amen, I want to hear that again. The best commentary on the Bible is the? Bible. Amen. Keep that in mind. People are always running to these guys, and I, 
I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm human. You're here listening to a human being talk. I'm not telling you to ever read a commentary, but you got to keep it in mind that you're, you're reading a human being. People run to Adam Clark. Uh, they'll run to uh, Matthew Henry. They were all messed up on their prophecy. They, 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 did, they didn't have, uh, well, I think for a lot of the uh, case, they didn't have a lot of the light we have today. I mean, they lived before, um, when was Matthew Henry? Was it 19th century or was it earlier? I mean, I can't remember when he lived, but he lived before electricity. You know, he, he lived before we even see a lot of these things fulfilled. Martin Luther is another one. When you read about his stuff about uh, Bible prophecy, he could not fathom how the Jews would go back to their land again. And for that reason, then he bought into the amillennial stuff that Augustine uh, started teaching, that there just wouldn't be a millennium. Why? He didn't live with the light we have. If Martin Luther lived today, I have no hesitation saying that he would be premillennial. His reason for not accepting millennial teaching was that he couldn't see how the Jews could ever go back to their land. Now they're there. <laughs> so what would he say? I think he would say, well, hmm, I was wrong about that. You know what? I believe a lot of people uh, really go against Luther because he was messed up on some things. But I believe he's in heaven right now saying, oh, I was wrong about that. <laughs> Amen. Okay, you're going to say the same thing. I'm not picking on Martin Luther. I'm going to say it. You're going to say it. We're going to be up in heaven and say, whoa, I was way off on that there. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know where I came from. You know. <laughs> But thank God it's under the blood. Amen. You know, we don't do it on purpose. We, don't, we want to set our mind to serving the Lord and being correct, but we're all human. Yeah. So the day of the Lord is not a 24-hour day. Can I say that again? It is the last three and a half year period, a day of God's wrath. The day of the Lord is the day of the wrath of the Lamb, according to the book of Revelation. And the prophet Zephaniah describes the day of the Lord by encompassing the events of Revelation 6-19. through you want to turn there. Zephaniah chapter 1. We're about to close it up. And, but I want, you know, we could go on for another hour. Amen. And I could show you all this stuff that shows the day of the Lord is encompassing the great tribulation period. Zephaniah, Zephaniah chapter 1 and verse 15 is where we're going to start. And it's talking about the day of the Lord. And the first words are, that day is a day of wrath. Mm -hmm. And again, that's what the book of Revelation says about the great tribulation period. It's the day of the wrath of God, the day of the wrath of the Lamb. The, that day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. <laughs> you think I repeat myself. Hey, look at that. How many and he is saying some of the same things Joel already said when we read in Joel 2. Same thing. Verse 16, read that. A day of the trumpet and alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. Now, you've read Re Revelation. There's how many trumpets? Seven. And then uh, the, the trump of God brings the church out in the, revel in the uh, rapture and resurrection. And then there's seven trumpets, and the final trumpet uh, at the end then is right before the return of Jesus Christ, which is where we're going to end our study of Mark 13 today. And verse 17, And I will bring di distress upon men. Now, as we read through Revelation, how many times you read about how the, the men uh, are crying for the mountains and the rocks to fall on them. Mm -hmm. But they, there's going to be a period of time where they won't even be able to die. I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men. Now, uh, some folks, like Martha, who have been doing that all their life, uh, they can impress you with the way they are able to walk around and, and avoid things. And they're hearing and you know, they can hear where things are. And they, I saw a guy, this one guy, he would just go like that with his mouth and they, uh, the sound bouncing off things, he could know exactly where to walk and everything. But these people, these are made blind they're going to walk like blind men, like somebody who's just now made blind. They've they had sight their whole life and then made blind. That's you talk about stumbling or brown. We've, we've done, we've done uh, experiments in school, and I did it with the girls. Uh, put those things on so you couldn't see anything and just have them walk around a little bit so they could see what it's like to lose their vision. And, and someone who's not used to that, they just stumble around. They just 
can't, can't even walk around. That's what it's going to be like in the tri tribulation period when all this is going on. Where are they going to go? Where are they going to turn? What are they going to do? They know. They're going to be like blind men because they know because they have sinned against the Lord. And their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. Bad, bad times. Verse 18 says, Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. You know, if Bill Gates uh, is, is still alive and the rapture takes place and we go in that tribulation period, all his money ain't going to save him. You think of the wealthiest man. When I was in the 80s, everybody always talked about Ted Turner. Ted Turner had a mother-in-law that preached the gospel to him and warned him of the rapture to come. I heard an interview where he talked about it. Ted Turner's money isn't going to save him. He's still alive if he lives into that tribulation period. Your silver, your gold will not deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of His jealousy. For He shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. Speedy riddance. Amen. Because at the end, when He does return, I mean, it's over. There's not a prolonged battle. In Mark 13, 26, this culminates then with the coming of Jesus Christ in wrath against His enemies, but with salvation for His elect. You study Bible prophecy. Do you realize you need to put yourself in there? You're involved in this. This is your future. How many of you got a five-year plan? This is more important. When we've studied Revelation, we're coming down closer to where we're going to see this. If you're saved right now, you're raptured. You go into a glorified state. When this happens, you... I mean, this is crazy talk because it's Bible. The world can believe in all kinds of wild stuff, but they won't believe this. You're coming back. You know that? When you're raptured, there's a second coming of Jesus Christ and His saints. If we're, we're really uh, careful and, and, and particular in the way we refer to this, we would always call it the return of Jesus Christ with His saints. That's why the rapture is before. Uh, we're going to be with Him when He returns. The Bible says He'll bring those who sleep in Jesus with Him at the rapture. And they'll get their body and then we go up after the dead in Christ. Then we go back with Him. And then when He returns, because at that time He doesn't land on the earth. He's in the air. The second, though, phase of that is when He comes at the end of the seven year tribulation. And that's when He lands on the earth. He lands on the Mount of Olives. He will split that mountain and a crevice will go right through that uh, graveyard that the Muslims put in in front of the beautiful gate. And they walled up the beautiful gate. Go look it up. The, the beautiful gate, the eastern gate, is walled up. You can't get through there right now. And they think they're going to block the Messiah. When He returns and lands on that mountain, He's going to split that thing and boom, right through there. And He's going to walk right up in onto the Temple Mount. And that's what this is referring to in verse 26. Read it with me. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Amen. Amen. Folks, that's what it's all about right there. That's what it's all about. I'm not telling you to sell everything you have, put on white robes, and go up on the mountain. But spiritually speaking, that really is all that matters. I mean, everything you do in your flesh right now, if it's not done with that in sight, that in focus, you're wasting your time. If you are not living your every day for the Lord, you're wasting your days. If you're spending all of your time and money to please your flesh, you're wasting your time and money. But the things that you do, and even if you do good works so that you can be praised, it's a waste. But if you do anything to bring glory to the name of Jesus Christ, that is what's going to last. That's what's going to be important. And everything you do that brings glory to God is going to be rewarded after that rapture. And it's not so that we can boast, we're not going to get in heaven and brag about our crowns. 
we're going to get up there and be rewarded and we're going to glory in the Lord Himself because He is the one who saved us from hell. He's the one who filled us with His Spirit. He's the one who has given us the opportunity to even be used of Him and to receive the reward. And that's why He alone forever and ever will receive the glory. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Father, we thank You, Lord, for this study and we thank You for the preciseness of this book. We thank You for the Holy Spirit who guides us and helps us to understand. And I pray everyone here today has just picked up something that they will never lose and they will always understand the day of the Lord when they study that book. And then when they go from Genesis to Revelation over and over and over, they're going to see that. All that information You've given us, all that revelation You've provided to us, and they're going to understand it. And it's going to help them, Lord. It's going to build them up, build their faith, make them strong so that they can serve You without fear not fearing man, but only fearing you and fearing you with a love and respect and honor that you deserve. And may Jesus be glorified. We pray in his precious name. Amen. 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 Just as I am
say amen. amen. Visit our website at bbfohio.com for links to hundreds of audio and video messages, as well as articles, links, and other free resources, and a new bookstore being developed offering additional items. This message was brought to you by Bible Believers Fellowship. I am Pastor Greg, and we thank you for listening.